שלום. I'm back. I apologize that uh, on the first round, on the first part of the introduction, my internet didn't work right. But uh, now I'm outside, outdoors, a beautiful spring day under the palm tree that is in front of my yard there's three of them and uh, I want to continue the introduction to the first book of Samuel lean back and uh, I know that the light is not so good but we'll have to bear with it now I, I uh, don't think I can teach and have my face toward the sun so this way we'll manage I got to the historical background of the book of Samuel which is very important to understand what was going on in the land of Israel in the days that God switched the polity the, the way that he ruled the people of Israel the period of the judges was around 200 years long and the judges were actually leaders for the moment for a specific need for a specific enemy of Israel a specific problem in Israel but that was not satisfactory for the children of Israel they wanted to have a king and and uh, the king they got so around Israel what was going on you had on the eastern part of the Jordan River the three nations that were essentially you know relatives you would say uh, cousins of or, 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 or yeah cousins of Israel two of them were the the, the children of, of, of Lot through his daughters that took advantage of their father and uh, and uh, after the, 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 the upheaval in Sodom they got him drunk they got pregnant from him and they had these two children that were children of incest and were the perennial enemies of Israel uh, living on the other side of the Jordan but on this side of Jordan, the Mediterranean coast, we meet another enemy. And that enemy was the Philistines. Now, who were the Philistines? In the book of Hosea, chapter uh, 14, we find out in verse 7 that the Philistines were brought from Kaftor. Kaftor is Crete, Greek, Minoan culture that was very strong at the time a great seafaring nation like the, the like the Phoenicians and uh, and there was big problems including earthquakes and and, and and you know natural disasters that hit the islands of Greece and especially Crete and the and war including to the natural disaster also war and many of the inhabitants of Crete decided to look for greener pastures as they say and they wanted to get into Egypt Egypt was like America it was like you know great empire but the Egyptians were too strong for them they couldn't uh, win the battle against the Egyptians it's a very famous war the war of Egypt against the people of the sea and they couldn't win against the Egyptians so they drifted up the coast and settled in an Egyptian territory with, with, I think, with Egypt's blessing, because the land of Canaan was a big mess. They settled on the southern shore of the Mediterranean. In other words, uh, they settled in five city-states that were actually a, a, a unit cooperating with each other, and these city-states were... Uh, listed several times in the in the Bible Gat was one of the big one Ashdod was one of them Ashkelon was one of them 
Ekron was one of them, and uh, and they uh, were a thorn in the flesh of Israel. They had stronger technology than the Israelites. The Israelites came out of the desert. They were slaves in Egypt. And Egypt itself was not such a great technological empire like the Greeks were, like the, the Philistines were. And they had a different uh, material culture. You can see that in the, in, the, in the Israel Museum. They had a different type of, uh, of shape of, of pottery, different color of pottery. Their pottery sometimes was bichrome, painted with two colors and with figures. And, and they essentially settled on the southern coast of the land of Israel. And they were a thorn in the, in the flesh. They had these cities, uh, I didn't mention Az Gaza first, in the first lesson, but it's Ashkelon, Ashdod, Akron, Aza, and Gat. As you can see, some of these uh, places like Ga Gaza are still a thorn in our flesh. And the people who lived there called themselves uh, Palestinians. Uh, after the, the 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 Philistines who lived there, the Palest name Palestinians was first used by the Romans, Palestine, then by the British, and it wasn't used. Generally speaking, wasn't used very much. But uh, in modern time, with the entrance of, of Israel and Zionism in the Middle East, the, these Arabs, who for most of them were sharecroppers, most of these Palestinians, uh, the land didn't belong to them. They belonged to all kinds of rich Arabs that lived in Istanbul or in Switzerland or in Paris or in London, and they, uh, they these were sharecroppers without any rights, almost slaves, uh, when, when the Zionists started to come here. But uh, they, they, they devised an identity for themselves that had nothing to do with them in, in, in fact. Because so they're not Greeks like the Philistines were. They, they don't come from Greek origin like the Philistines were. And they were uh, essentially here. And we're going to meet them in the book of First Samuel, Second Samuel. We are going to uh, meet with them. And... David had dealings with them, and then the others had dealings with them way up to the times of Solomon that became a very powerful king in the Middle East and was able to essentially uh, either adopt them and absorb them or eradicate them. I think that he more, more absorbed them. The culture and the riches of Solomon's era uh, essentially, you know, assimilated the, the Philistines into the, the inhabitants of the land, as they say. In the book of Judges, we find out in chapter 3, verse 1 to 4, that these are the nations which fought against Israel and said that God tried Israel by their enemies. God tried Israel by their enemies, and who were their enemies? Uh, it, it, and, and he wanted them to learn how to, to do war through their enemies. So there were the five cities of the Philistines that I mentioned, the Canaanite and the Sidonite, the people from Tyra, and the Hivite that dwelled in the uh, mountains of Lebanon uh, and near the Mount Her Hermon. And, and these were the nations that God essentially appointed here to be, uh, you know, to train Israel to do war, A, and B, to test Israel to see if they are going to be faithful or not. Now, I said in the last introduction, I got to the place that the beginning of the book of, of, of Samuel uh, starts with the story of a woman, a woman that was barren, couldn't have children. And there was... I will uh, read the text. I have it here in English, in Hebrew, I mean, but I'm going to read it in English from my iPad, not from the book, 
but from my iPad because I have English Bibles here in, in my iPad. I'm going to the first book of Samuel, chapter 1, from verse 1. Okay. Samuel. First Samuel, chapter 1, verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramataim Tzofim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Yehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Tzuf, an Ephraimite. All right. Interesting. I know that most people don't think that this is interesting. But to me, this is very interesting. Why does the Holy Spirit bother to tell us all this genealogy and short history of a man called Elkanah that comes from Ramataim Tzofim, which is actually a place between Shiloh and Shechem. And he's from the tribe of Ephraim. Clearly, that territory of Shiloh was tr the tribe of Ephraim. And uh, we, we know his, his father is Yoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Tzuf, an Ephraimite. What is, what, what is here that is important for us to know? I'll tell you what is here that is important for us to know. He is a descendant of the Korahites. The Korahite rebellion in the wilderness, that the land opened up and swallowed them. And apparently, not all their children were swallowed, were dead. Descendants of Korah remained. And we find them also later on in the book of, of, of uh, uh, First Chronicles. Yeah. In other words, this family survived. Apparently, some of their children survived. And this Ephraimite had two wives. And the name of one, uh, one was Hannah, and the name of, name of the other, Pnina. Pnina had children, but Hannah had no children. I said in the first uh, part of the introduction that most of the mothers of this nation and the most important women in our history were barren, couldn't have children. It's Sarah and Rachel and Rebecca and Rachel and, and, uh, and now Hannah is in that list. Why is this? Why does God choose women who were barren to be essentially the mothers of our faith, the mothers of our, uh, of our relationship in Israel, and then finally through Yeshua. Miriam, Yeshua's mother, was also supernaturally God involved in the giving of the birth of Yeshua. There is a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is to show us that those leaders, including David, that had problems with his mother, were chosen and operated and owed their life to the mighty God of Israel and His grace. There is something that is not of the animal nature in the people that God has chosen. It's something that God is involved in their very existence, in their very identity. And Hannah is a woman that 
plays a central role in the beginning and the introduction to Samuel. It, the Bible tells us that this woman for several years had not been able to get pregnant. Whereas Penina, Penina means pearl. Pearl. And Hannah means one that received God's grace, God's forgiveness. And Hannah, year after year, goes on the holiday to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord at Shiloh. Why at Shiloh? Because the tabernacle was at Shiloh for a long period of history. Probably a couple of hundred years at least. Her husband took his two wives and his children and brought them to Shiloh. And in Shiloh, a man, the children of Israel, the men of Israel came to Shiloh to worship because the tabernacle of God was there. There was no temple in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not in the hands of Israel still until the days of David. And uh, they went to Shiloh, into the tabernacle, not a building, a tent. And in that tent, there was a, a, a priest, chief priest, by the name of Eli, Eli in modern Hebrew. And he had two children, Hophni and Pinchas. And they were all Kohanim, priests. And when the time of offering came, the holiday came, Elkanah, which means zealous for God, or God is zealous, came with his whole family, Pnina and Hana and their children, the sons and the daughters, to celebrate in the house of God, in the tent of meeting, in the, in the tabernacle. And, of course, Hannah would always give a double portion of sacrifice. Would be given by her husband, Elkanah, a double portion of sacrifice meat. Why? Because the Lord had closed her womb from God. Today we think everything is natural. In the Bible, you find out that nature has its own course, but God has a hand in nature. He has a hand in the plagues. Every plague in the Bible, near a hundred times plagues are mentioned in the Bible. Actually, a little more than a hundred times. And every one of these plagues came from God, and every one of these plagues was resolved by God. So here in this case, the Lord had closed her womb. It was not a natural thing. And her arrival also provoked her. Provoked her severely and made her miserable. Because the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, Pnina, Pearl. Mini Pearl. Teased Hana. Provoked Hana. Talked against Hana. Blamed Hana that she has no children. So that's why Hannah wept. She cried. And Elkanah, her husband, tells her in verse 8 of chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, Hannah, why do you cry? Why do you weep? Why don't you eat? And why does your heart uh, grieve? Am I not better than ten? Sons, so whatever Elkanah told Hannah on this occasion didn't help her, made her angry. So when the family finished eating the sacrifice and celebrating, Hannah rose and went into the tabernacle. And the high priest Eli was sitting on the seat 
and his seat was leaning backwards on the doorpost of the tabernacle. Oh, he was, you know, tired, relaxed, oh, just after lunch, big holiday lunch, was leaning backwards on that seat, on the doorpost of the tabernacle. And Hannah was in the bitterness of her soul. And she turned and prayed to God and wept in anguish. She made a vow and said, O oh Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on my affliction, the affliction of your main maidservant, and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maid servant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. What does that mean? It means that he's going to be a Nazarite, according to the laws of the Torah of Nazarites. He will not get a haircut or shave his beard. We have a very famous Nazarite in the book of the 13th chapter of the book of Judges. His name was Samson from the tribe of Dan. And his mother received a vision from an angel of the Lord and then the angel had to repeat her vision to the father, to the husband, the mother of, uh, uh, the, the father of, of Samson. that he will be a Nazarite and will not cut his hair. So she's promising that if God gives her a son, the son will be dedicated to the Lord and will be a Nazarite, will not cut his hair. And Hannah spoke from her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli, Eli, in Hebrew, thought she was drunk. And Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. Now, it's interesting. It's interesting. In the house of the Lord, in the celebration of the holiday, with sacrifices to the Lord, people had drunk wine as well it was a part of the ceremony and for jews wine is still a part of the ceremony every friday night every normal jew including jesus and the apostles they drank wine to say the blessings part of the blessings of the shabbat require wine or grape juice if you want if you're baptist you can have grape juice why not yeah, but Jews drink wine. They don't get drunk. The number of drunkards and alcoholics among the Jews is very low. Very low compared to the non-Jews. But they drink wine. Jesus drank wine. The apostles drank wine. Jesus made wine. Uh, I think, personally, that it is right to teach our children to drink drink wine wisely soberly and not get drunk i drank wine from the time i was a baby my father always gave me to drink wine not only wine even stronger drink but i've never been drunk a single time in my life why because as a child i was taught to drink wine wisely with food one glass it's enough but it's a sin to tell people that it's a sin to drink wine. It's a sin, I'm repeating that, to tell people not to drink wine. And we see here that this woman, Hannah, drank wine. And that the other people that came to the worship in the tabernacle in Shiloh drank wine. And he thought that she drank too much wine and she was uh, drunk. In effect, she was not drunk. 
You know that the apostles in the Acts chapter 2 that spoke from the Holy Spirit, the people around Jerusalem that saw them and heard them thought that they were drunk from wine, but they were not drunk from wine. They were not drunk from wine. They were drunk from the Holy Spirit. They were acting ecstatically like prophets often do in the Bible. And they were thought to be drunk. So this Hannah was, probably didn't drink. I don't know if she drank, but Il Eli thought she was drunk. And he tells her, put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am not a woman sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured my soul before the Lord. Oh, I like this verse. I have poured my soul before the Lord. How many times have you or I poured our soul before the Lord? We are taught kind of a Protestant uh, teaching that we have to be composed always. And we have to be, you know, bite our lips, bite our tongue, and control our emotions. No. Who controlled these emotions in the Bible? Tell me. Tell me one character that controlled these emotions. Was it King David? Was it King Solomon? Was it Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Hosea, or any of the other prophets? Who controlled these emotions in the, in, the, in the Bible? Did Jesus control his emotions? Listen, you read the New Testament, the Gospels, you find out that Jesus did not control his emotions always. There were times when he expressed his emotions strongly in the temple he turned tables of the money changers the bankers over pouring their their their, their money and their coins to the ground getting ropes and using them as whips but also he, he, he reprimanded the apostles as well he didn't he, you know he was not a a politically correct person according to today's rules of what is politically correct and neither was anybody else in the Bible so Hannah is not shy she tells the, the high priest Eli no I'm not drunk I didn't have any uh, wine or hard liquor what I do have is I poured my soul before the Lord Don't think that your maidservant is a wicked woman. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Okay. We all have challenges. We all have moments of sorrow. We all have some issues with the Lord. Yes, yes, yes. It's okay to have issues with the Lord. The Lord has issues with us too. And we as human beings naturally would have issues with the Lord because we don't understand how he works always. Most of my teaching is, is concentrated to understand how God works. And, and one of the things that I've understood long before now is that God uses people like Hannah people like Pharaoh's daughter, people like Sarah, people like Rachel, to demonstrate his power and his control over the life and over the ministry and over the purpose of his children and his human beings. So here is this woman crying to the Lord She answers him. Verse 16, do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman. You know, if she would have been drunk, she would have been considered a wicked woman. She's not drunk. But out of the abundance of my complaint, of my sorrow and grief, I've spoken until now. And Eli, Eli the high priest answers her, go in peace 
and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. She answers Eli, let your maid servant find favor in your sight. So that when, so the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. She poured out her heart to the Lord, and she got consolation from God and confirmation, the blessing of Eli, the high priest, that told her, "Go in peace, shalom aleichem." Ve'elohe Yisrael iten lachet bakashotech. Go in peace. The God of Israel will grant your petition which you have asked of him. He not sure yet. I'm not sure whether he understood what, what was the problem or not, but but he blessed her. And you should know if you have the power of God to bless, don't keep it to yourself and don't charge money for it ever because it's going to backfire against you give what god gave you freely give it out freely you will never regret and you will never lack the mercenary attitude of, of so many christians today pastors and leaders that everything is money 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 is not a healthy thing it's not a healthy thing and it's against the scriptures and it's against the earliest documents of the early church. According to the earliest documents of the early church, the earliest one after the New Testament is called the Didache, which means the teaching of the apostles to the, for the Gentiles. It says if anybody claims to be a, a, a leader, a pastor, a prophet of the Lord, and asks money, he's a false prophet. Don't accept him. Don't ask money. Don't charge for your teaching. Don't charge for your serving. Let the Lord take care of you and He will. Because if you want to take care of your own business, He will allow you to do it. And you are not as good a businessman as God is Himself. That's right. So, Miss Hannah gets up goes away eats and her face is no longer sad and they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the lord and returned and came back to their house at, at rama oh i made a mistake in the beginning of the introduction i said that Ramataim Tzofim was north of, of, of Shiloh. But now I understand from this text that it's near Rama. I can see Rama. Right now I look to the side and I can see Rama. Who else came from Rama? From Ramataim. The guy who gave his grave to Yeshua. After the crucifixion, Joseph of Eramatia, in Greek Eramatia, in Hebrew Ramataim, and, and, and you can see Ramataim behind me, there on the side, behind me, Ramataim, Ramot, in Hebrew. We lost the, the, the dual uh, grammar, uh, constructions in, gra in Hebrew grammar, and we made it plural. It was Rama time, the only dual in Hebrew remain in the body parts. Enaim, Oznaim, Shinaim, Yadaim, Raglaim, dual. Rama time, dual. But now we, the, the, the same Rama, double Rama, is called Ramot in the plural. So they came from here. Not south of, of, of Shiloh, not north of Shiloh. I made a mistake. And so they returned home. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the, 
process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked from the, him for him from the Lord. And the Lord heard me, in essence, that's what it says. Samuel, it means Shama here, El. El heard me, heard my prayer. Ah, what a wonderful name. Oh, what a wonderful concept. God heard her prayer. You know what? God hears our prayer, especially if we pray in the name of Yeshua. And this is an exciting study. And I am now going to close this in introduction by repeating this point. The story of transition in the Bible. Generally speaking, starts and ends with women. Shabbat, we're reading the first six chapters of five chapters and one verse of chapter six of the book of Exodus. It's also a story of transition from being the most honored guests in Egypt by the Pharaoh in the days of jo Joseph to becoming slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, another Pharaoh that did not know Joseph. Yes, we're going to continue this study. It's going to get much more interesting and hotter as we go on because this, this, this book will serve in your life as a basis to understand so much more of the history of Israel and of the text of the Bible from birth, first book of Samuel to the second book of Samuel to the first book of Kings to the second book of Kings to the books of Chronicle, the first book of Chronicle. All of these books and all of this history cannot be understood without first understanding how the royal house of Israel, of, of, of David from Judah, the tribe of Judah, and then the royal house of Israel uh, developed and how it ended. This is the beginning. It starts with a woman named Hannah who was barren, couldn't have a child, and God opened up her womb because she prayed sincerely, she prayed honestly, she poured out her heart to the Lord, and the Lord heard her prayer. May God bless all of us and hear our prayers, publicly and private prayers as well. In Yeshua's name, Amen.